Hi and welcome to this session on congenital heart disease imaging. I am Dr. Major Vimal Raj. I am a consultant cardiothoracic radiologist working in Narayana Institute of Cardiac Sciences in India, Bangalore. First of all, I would like to thank Gerbe TV to give me this opportunity to be talking to you on this very interesting topic of imaging of pulmonary hypertension in patients with congenital heart disease. I would like to introduce you all to this uh, very wonderful book, uh, which I have uh, co-written with some of my colleagues from India, where we exclusively talk about congenital heart disease imaging on CT and MRI. This is a single book which is dedicated for just congenital heart disease. The objective for me today is to talk to you about clearly making you understand what is pulmonary hypertension, the classification of pulmonary hypertension. Then I will be talking about the pathophysiology and the role of imaging in pulmonary hypertension. As we go along, I'm going to be showing you multiple cases and I'm going to summarize at the end by telling you what all things you should look for in a patient suspected to have pulmonary artery hypertension. This is an important concept which I want all of you to clearly understand. Pulmonary hypertension is not same as pulmonary artery hypertension. Okay, Pulmonary hypertension is a large group of diseases where the pressure within the pulmonary vasculature is increased. That is what is called pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary artery hypertension is a subgroup within the pH. So pH or pulmonary hypertension versus PAH. pH is like a large group of uh, diseases. One such group within the pH is pulmonary artery hypertension. In pulmonary arterial hypertension, what you find is that the pulmonary arteries itself are abnormal, leading to raised pulmonary pressures. While in pulmonary hypertension, it can be pulmonary veins, it can be other uh, pathologies such as lung pathology, which is causing pulmonary hypertension. For pulmonary arterial hypertension, you need a mean pulmonary arterial pressure of more than 20 millimeters of mercury as per definition and you need a pulmonary vascular resistance of more than 3 wood units. So PAH or pulmonary arterial hypertension is secondary to abnormality of pulmonary arteries leading to the raised pressure while pulmonary hypertension is raised pulmonary pressure due to multiple etiologies. A newer classification of pulmonary hypertension has been proposed, accepted and is very well used now which is demonstrated here. This basically divides pulmonary hypertension based on the etiology into five specific groups. Okay, And when you look at this you can see group 1 which is pulmonary artery hypertension which we are going to talk about today. Group 2 is the pulmonary venous side of things or the post capillary hypertension where the left heart is involved and group 3 is where the lung is the problem like a interstitial lung disease. Group 4 is one of the easily treatable causes which is called as chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension where you can do a pulmonary endarterectomy. Group 5 is a multifactorial pathology. Today we're going to be talking about group 1 and in specific, within the group 1, we're going to be talking about congenital heart disease. Let us try and understand the pathophysiology of pulmonary hypertension. Now, if you look at this, this is the normal uh, vasculature of a lung and this is the abnormal vasculature of the lung. In congenital heart disease, it starts with increased flow or increased pressure in the lung parenchyma or pulmonary arteries, often secondary to a shunt. ASD, VSD, PDA, multiple different types of shunts lead to increased flow. As the hemodynamic force increases, there is disturbance of flow, which actually leads to stiffening of the blood vessels, leads to thickening of the wall of the blood vessels, which in turn leads to the vessel becoming smaller in size and what we see as a peripheral pruning of the vessels. So this muscularization of the wall of the pulmonary artery is the cause of pulmonary artery hypertension in patients with congenital heart disease. Mm -hmm. 
This usually starts off with a left to right shunt where there is a volume overload. The receptors which are available at the wall of the vessels have an altered expression leading to vessel wall thickening which in turn leads to increased pulmonary vascular resistance. The next important parameter when it comes to pathophysiology is in patients with pulmonary hypertension, the survival depends purely on the right ventricle and how it copes. So first and foremost, what tends to happen is this is the normal right ventricle, a crescent shaped right ventricle. As the volume increases, it tends to get dilated with some RV hypertrophy and the septum starts to get straightened. This straightening of the septum leads to LV getting compressed, can eventually lead to LV dysfunction also. And as the RV dilates, there is tricuspid regurgitation. And as more and more muscle gets put in the right ventricle, there is increased oxygen demand. And at one point in time, the body is unable to cope with this degree of RV dilatation and hypertrophy that leads to RV dysfunction. So why do we need to know about all this? When we look at a patient with uh, pulmonary hypertension, RV can remain in a compensated phase, which basically means that the RV is affected but not badly involved. Where you are seeing RV hypertrophy, RV dilatation, septal bowing to the left has started, but the right ventricular ejection fraction is maintained. The function of the right ventricle is maintained. If this continues to go on and RV function drops or the volume of the RV starts to drop, that leads to decompensated phase. And this is the phase where patients really do not do well. So the ability of RV to sustain with the pressure and volume overload is a single parameter which detects survival and functional capacity of these patients. So now you've understood the pathophysiology, let's try and see how you recognize pulmonary hypertension in a CT scan and an MRI scan. The basic principles are to look for the size of the pulmonary artery at the level of the bifurcation. If it is bigger than three centimeters or bigger than the corresponding iota, this is one feature. Second feature is to look at the size of the right ventricle. The right ventricle also tends to dilate as part of pulmonary hypertension. And you may start seeing contrast refluxing into the IVC and hepatic veins as part of pulmonary hypertension. These features are very good features, especially in adults, but in children also, sometimes these hold good if there is no pulmonary stenosis or there is no valvular pathology. So look out for these findings in all the cases of CT. In CT, the other parameter that you should look for is the RV hypertrophy and also RV dilatation with the septum getting straightened or bowing towards the left side. And when you can see this, where there is bowing to the left side, this indicates a systolic pulmonary artery pressure of more than 67 millimeters of mercury. So this is a ball part figure when you start seeing this that you can think about and say okay the pulmonary artery pressure must be this much. Also if the RV wall thickness is more than 6 millimeter or the RV to LV lumen is more than 1.28 uh, percent and if there is IVC reflux of contrast all of these indicate poor prognosis in patients with pulmonary hypertension. MRI is uh, of very great value in assessment of patients with pulmonary hypertension. What you can very nicely see in this case is dilatation of the RV free wall and as the RV dilates, you will also see the movement of the septum, the septum becoming dyskinetic and poking itself into the LV side, which is a poor prognostic feature. All of these parameters as they increase in a patient, especially if you are trying to follow them up, it will tell us whether the therapy which is being given to the patient is working well or not working well. So cardiac MR is becoming more and more important in diagnosis as well as follow up of these patients with pulmonary hypertension. Let us look at this one case. This is an interesting case. I have put the video in the center there and I put some of the representative images 
which clearly show us that there is right ventricular hypertrophy. RV is dilated in this case. You can see that the pulmonary artery is also grossly dilated. So the cause of this is something that you need to see on CT. And uh, once you go through it one more time, I will show you the respective images where you can make a diagnosis if you've already not made the diagnosis. So look for different etiologies, the ASD, the VSD, look for any shunts, anomalous pulmonary venous connection, etc. to make up your mind to decide what is the cause of pulmonary hypertension in this patient. And when you see the specific images, what you can see is the abnormal pulmonary venous drainage goes to the right side of the heart in this patient leading to severe pulmonary hypertension. A different case now when you look at this, this is a patient again who's come in with pulmonary hypertension. You can see the pulmonary arteries are grossly dilated. The pulmonary venous return is normal. But when you can uh, see here, there is a large PDA in this patient, which would account for the pulmonary hypertension in this case. One another case that I would like to show you where you are looking for different pathologies and you see this abnormal communication between the iota and the pulmonary artery called as the AP window. A different case again you can see here iota and pulmonary artery have this abnormal communication in keeping with an AP window. These are all different causes of pulmonary hypertension in congenital heart disease that you need to be aware of. One other uncommon cause of pulmonary hypertension is this entity where you can see a single vessel arising from the ventricle, the truncus arteriosus, which then divides into the pulmonary artery and iota, although there is a VSD also present in this case. So truncus arteriosus as another etiology for pulmonary hypertension. MRI is extremely useful in assessing shunt lesions and in this case you can see a very nice shunt from the left side to the right side which is at the level of the ASD which helps us in not only quantifying the shunt but also telling us which direction the shunt is going. It is fantastic in assessing the QP by QS ratio and helps us in determining the etiology of pulmonary hypertension. So, important point for all of you to remember is what is the role of imaging in pulmonary artery hypertension in congenital heart disease. First and foremost, we diagnose whether it is present or not present. Then we look for a cause of pulmonary artery hypertension. Once we've determined the cause of it, it is important for us to classify pulmonary artery hypertension and to look and see whether it is reversible or irreversible because if it is reversible, then it needs surgical correction. If it is irreversible, then we manage them medically. The classification of pulmonary artery hypertension in congenital heart disease has these four groups. Simplest one is the Eisenmenger syndrome. What is Eisenmenger? Initially, there is a left to right shunt because the pressure in the left heart is high and the shunt goes to the right side. But as the pulmonary pressures increase, the right-sided pressure becomes so high that the shunt gets reversed and it becomes a right to left shunt. This is a point where we cannot operate or close the shunt because the patient will not do well at all. So Eisenmengerization is something we need to recognize and clearly tell the clinical team that this has reached a point where we cannot surgically correct it. The second one is a left to right shunt. One is reversible, which basically means the pressure is high in the pulmonary system, but if the shunt is stopped, it can be reverted back to normal. And irreversible, the shunt is so big, the pressures are so high, whatever we do now, it's beyond that time, so surgical correction is not good. The third group is again very common where you see pulmonary arterial hypertension with a congenital heart disease. For example, a patient will have severe pulmonary hypertension with a tiny ASD which cannot account for it or they may have severe pulmonary hypertension with just one abnormal pulmonary venous drainage to the right side. In those cases, it is just a coincidental finding and unlikely to account for pulmonary hypertension. 
One other thing is postoperative pulmonary artery hypertension, which is basically in patients who have uh, PAH, you operate and then the pulmonary pressures persist to be high. This brings us on to the most important question, whether the pulmonary hypertension is reversible or not. As of now, when we look at some specific clinical scenarios, for example, a child under the age of six months who's got a TGA or transposition of great arteries or a truncus arteriosus, they are likely to be reversible. VSDs or PDA under the age of one year are also likely to be reversible and ASDs are commonly reversible. These patients should undergo uh, surgery and there is no need for catheterization. However, if you have a patient who has got a QPQS of less than two or they start to have clinical symptoms of uh, cyanosis, saturations are uh, less than 95, then it may be an indication that it is irreversible and these people need catheterization. Currently, catheterization is used to look at the pulmonary vascular resistance, compare the pulmonary vascular resistance with the systemic vascular resistance to come up with this uh, ratios and based on these ratios, it is advised whether we should do a shunt closure or not. There is growing evidence that we in imaging can actually do this non-invasively by looking at some of the parameters, one parameter being the pulmonary arterial stiffness resistance, whereby we can look at how well the pulmonary artery expands and collapses between systole and diastole to assess whether it is a reversible cause or not. Cardiac MR is very, very useful in determining prognostic features for patients with pulmonary artery hypertension. You look for myocardial fibrosis. You make sure that uh, the flow patterns are good. If you start to see early systolic peak but reduced flow, that is a sign of pulmonary hypertension in uh, Q-flow studies of cardiac MR. Change in flow pattern when you give them 100% oxygen or nitrous oxide, for example, there is uh, a higher pressure pattern, but you give them 100% oxygen or nitrous oxide and the flow rate reduces or the flow pressure reduces, that actually suggests that it is reversible and the patient can be taken for surgical correction. Also, look for PA stiffness and PVR assessment as well as the mean pulmonary arterial assessment. Now these two parameters, there is still uh, ongoing research with different techniques uh, giving us a surrogate marker of uh, PVR on cardiac MR as well as the mean pulmonary arterial pressure on cardiac MR. Not well substantiated in large scale studies, but it is only time that we will be able to do this in cardiac MR. Now, this is what a uh, face contrast image looks like. You do a flow at the level of the pulmonary artery. You look at the circumference of the pulmonary artery in diastole. You look it at systole and you compare the arterial stiffness. The vessels which are highly stiff and are not collapsible are suggestive of irreversible state of pulmonary hypertension, while the other vessels which are nicely collapsing suggest that it is reversible state of pulmonary hypertension and patients can be taken up for surgical correction. A comprehensive cardiac MR assessment is the best way forward where you do a pulmonary angiogram, you look at the RV volumes and function, you look for fibrosis in the RV insertion sites which are associated with poor prognosis, you look for the flow pattern and all of these are able to give you important prognostic indicators of patients with pulmonary hypertension. 4D flow, the newer technology, which basically is showing two different patients where you can see a normal streamlined flow across the pulmonary artery in normal patients while you start to get this vortex or central area of uh, turbulence with surrounding change in the flow pattern in patients with pulmonary hypertension. All of these things are extremely useful to non-invasively image these patients and make their treatment uh, plans. So in summary, I would like to say that 
pulmonary artery hypertension in congenital heart disease is important for you to pick but the most important question is what is the cause of pulmonary artery hypertension and is it reversible or not if it is reversible then we advise them surgical correction if it is irreversible then we ask them to go for medical management CT is extremely easy uh, to do and uh, to analyze the anatomy but MR provides us much more information especially when you're looking at the functional data to see whether therapy is working or not and when we are following them up also if we want to take them up for surgery it is extremely useful in that manner finally newer advances are happening on a daily basis and I'm sure Cardiac MR will become the first line imaging modality after echo in patients with pulmonary hypertension. Thank you very much for uh, joining this webinar and I hope you have learned some new concepts and are able to implement these in your clinical practice. Thank you very much.